Let's talk about Celtic swords and their style of sword fighting. Hello everyone, I am Jonathan, also known as the Medieval Genie, and like I said in the title, it's going to be about the Celtic styles. Now, right off the bat, I should probably mention one of the key problems with this, which is that there are no actual sources. Now, as much as I'm going to be going a lot less on conjecture than people who have no experience with any style of historical sword fighting, the earliest manuscripts we've got access to, well, that have even been found in fact, and that I have been looking at, are from around the 1300s, which obviously is at least a thousand years after the sorts of time periods that we're talking about. So bear that in mind, just based on the sort of knowledge and experience I have, I will do my best to get a a sort of starting point, an idea of what Celtic sword fighting might have looked like. So, looking at the sort of shapes and designs of Celtic swords, uh, one thing that I find quite certain about them is that they weren't absolutely specialised towards cutting or thrusting. I notice in movies and television you usually see Roman soldiers using stabbing and then Celtic fighters using cutting and it's sort of this contrast between them, but in reality it probably would have been that both sides were using degrees of cuts or thrusts, and that it would have been less to do with the overall styles of fighting and more what would, what would be done by the individual fighters. Some people would prefer thrusting more, some would prefer cutting more, depending on their physique and other factors like that. But from what I've seen of Celtic swords, they all have reasonable points on them, and indeed some things like what I've heard called the Celtic rapier type of thing is actually quite leaning to more towards the thrust, where it sort of starts broader and then gradually tapers towards the tip. And that where you've got swords with a flare on them, they don't suddenly taper towards the tip, there is a bit more of a gradual tapering. And again, that leans towards the idea that these swords are useful for both cutting and thrusting. There's a lot of comparison, actually, with medieval arming swords, where you get some which are a bit more towards the cut or a bit more towards the thrust, but very few of them tend to go whole hog for just one or just the other. And you do see certain designs, like, for example, a falcata, which lean a bit more towards sort of the chopping, what with its forward curve, similar to a uh, Gurkha Kukri, but really, again, they have fine enough points that they can be used for both cutting and thrusting in various ways. And it seems that really, like I said, it goes down to the individual fighters and the overall styles that would have been taught would incorporate fairly even amounts of cutting and thrusting, depending more on circumstances and what techniques work. For example, getting around shields or when you've got certain openings created. So, since I've mentioned there is a comparison with medieval arming swords, although, again, we don't have manuscripts to show exactly how Celtic people fought, we can have a rough idea based on looking at later techniques, because there are some things which are universal truths. Firstly, uh, you would probably see that people start with their sword behind them. Now, just like when you're looking at something like Fiore's arming sword, or things like Sword and Buckler, if you stick your hand in front of you, <coughs> excuse me, you're usually seeing that people are going to get injured. So, with something like later using rapiers, using military sabres, that sort of thing, you see people doing this, so they have footwork and handiwork where their sword is in front of them a lot of the time, and it provides a passive defence. This is very easy to do, and it's quite a safe thing to do, when you have a complex hilt, like on a swept hilt rapier, or if you have a simple basket hilt, like you see in a lot of British mil and other military sabres. But 
as soon as you're looking at less hand protection, even with a cross guard of a medieval sword, it's a very dangerous thing to do. And on something like a Celtic sword, you don't even have that. So any time that you have your sword in front of you, your hands and forearms are exposed to attacks. So instead, although obviously you can't do things like bring your sword and parry, or do a stab, or cut at someone without bringing your hand forward, they wouldn't keep it forward. It's more of a transitional thing. So you'd start with your sword behind you. It could be raised aloft, it could be maybe somewhere like on the shoulder, it could be down below them. But the sword would usually be starting level with the body or with the hands behind the body. And then maybe at most you might have something where the sword's point is in front, but the actual hand area is still level with or behind the rest of the body so that you're not exposing targets for the enemy to exploit. And this applies quite a lot, so especially with shields. Now, it should be noted that the swords, again, because they don't have the complex hilts, they, they could hypothetically be used on their own, but it seems like they are very much designed to be used sword and shield in combination, as often as a Celt can manage. So, we'd be looking at sword and shield techniques for a lot of the time. Now, with sword and shield, you are... Uh, I'd mentioned this in my sword and shield basics video, that you do not use them one and the other. You never bring the sword out and then you remove the shield because your body becomes exposed to attack. I guarantee you, although obviously I can't bet anything because I don't have any conclusive evidence, but I can guarantee you that no trained Celtic warrior would deliberately go and do attacks or defences using their sword and bring their shield away. You always have the shield in front of you. Either, you know, you can use it passively, close to your body, it's nice and relaxed, something like that. This is certainly viable where, you know, the person maybe wants to have a bit of, not exert themselves too much, get a bit of a rest. And the item, the shield, acts kind of like a passive form of body armour, really. But you can also bring the shield out in front of you, similar to what you see in sword and buckler treatises. So, having the shield in front of you, the sort of cone of defence widens. It's the, To simplify the concept, if you had something like a small shield, if you look at my, my hand, and you imagine that's the shield on a much smaller scale, I'm covering myself a lot less, so you look at my face and how much it covers, so before, when it's close to me, it's not covering much. However, as I bring it forwards, it covers more. That's just how the simple cone of defense works. So again, you can keep the shield close to your body, which is nice and passive, it's relaxed, it doesn't exert you much, but it covers less. You can bring the shield forwards, and then it covers more. Now, there are two main ways that I've seen sword and shield fighting done like this. Um, either the when you are doing things like attacks, you either bring the sword and the shield sort of tight together. So let's say I was to stab, instead of stabbing and bringing the shield away, or stabbing and having it separate to the shield, I stab or cut, of course, with the shield. And to stop the shield from being in a way, bearing in mind most Celtic shields seem to not use straps like a medieval heater shield. They actually had a centre grip, what's called a shield boss. You can instead just rotate it, so as the hand is turned, the shield can rotate pretty much 180 degrees. So then you'd be able to rotate the shield so it faces out like that, or in like that, and then simply do your cuts and thrusts around the shield. And then the other way of doing it is where you simply have it detached, so I could, let's say, someone's going to attack down on my skull, I could parry high, cut low. Or I could, for example, parry out to my left and cut from my right. This sort of style of separating it is also viable. So whether the shield was used tightly with the sword or whether it was used separately, I'm not certain whether Celtic styles would have encouraged one over the other more, because both styles are valid and they might not have existed you know, one might have come before the other, we're not certain. But both of those sorts of things would have been viable, and you could certainly imagine Celtic fighters using that sort of method of fighting. And besides that, since 
the Celtic swords again don't have cross guards. Pretty much all of the powering would have been done with the shield. Although, like you see, some people have tried to recreate with Viking types of styles, which again we don't have treatises for, uh, you can do things like punch with the shield, and you can do things to open up gaps, you can do things to sort of tie up a person's hands with their sword or their shield, so you can lock off areas and do things like that to control the fight. I would not have expected many Celtic fighters to parry with their sword, especially when they've got a shield available. Because not only is there the fact that you've got no cross guard, so it's a lot more dangerous, but additionally, iron quality was worse in those time periods, especially in the early Iron Age, than they would have been in the later medieval periods. So there is also the problem that you might end up with the edge of your sword getting chewed up if you parry on the edge. If you parry on the flat, there's the problem that you could end up with a breakage, or usually if the sword isn't hardened as much to play it safe, then it could end up taking a bend and a set. So it's much more preferable to parry as much with the shield as possible. So in that situation, you'd have quite a distinct role of the sword does the attack, the shield does the defense, and you can maybe do some offensive shield actions to control the fight more. Whereas when I found myself fighting with something like Sword and Buckler with a medieval style, I kind of switch a little bit and I do sometimes, for example, use the shield to block an area, maybe a person's fainting, and I will block with the sword and I can follow up and do something like that. I wouldn't imagine it particularly well for a Celtic sword, like I said, it's because of the iron quality, because of the, the lack of hand protection, it's a lot more dangerous to do something like that. So I'd expect all of the defence to be done either with something like footwork, which is difficult in formation when fighting, or using just your shield. So that's that. Um, apologies for taking so long to describe it, but yeah, sword fighting is quite an interesting and long topic to talk about, and I hope you gained some information from that. And if anybody uncovers any treatises before the year, you know, before 1300, on any kind of sword fighting, do let me know, I'd love to study it. And that's that for today. Ta-ra for now.